What's up, you lazy, entitled, basement-dwelling millennials, bootstrapping boomers, apathetic Xers, and goddamn Gen Z kids today? We have a, uh, a special guest with us, Taylor and I do, uh, Andrea Crooms. She is running for Congress, um, and she is our first political candidate on the podcast, so we're really excited to have her. Uh, would you uh, mind introducing yourself, telling us... Uh, uh, what you're running for um, and who you're running against, and we'll we'll just kind of get into it here. Sure. So my name is Andrea Crooms. Um, I am running for the U.S. House of Representatives in Maryland's 5th Congressional District, which is about 1,500 square miles of rural, quasi-urban, and suburban communities um, outside of the Beltway of D.C. and south into southern Maryland. So it, it consists of um, the entirety of Charles County, St. Mary's County, and Calvert County, and a part of Anne Arundel County and a part of Prince George's County. I live in Prince George's County. Um, I live about 15 miles outside of uh, Washington, D.C. on a little farm here. Um, and yeah, I, I have had the same representative here my entire life, which is who I'm running against, uh, <laughs> Steny Hoyer, who has been our representative for 43 years. I am 44 years old. Um, and, you know, I run the Department of Environment here in Prince George's County. I've been an activist and, you know, involved in organizing around a whole bunch, wide gamut of social issues for essentially my entire life. And I had a baby in November and I just felt like this was something that I really needed to do to uh, just bring some new blood into Congress, some new ideas into Congress. And, you know, maybe speak for my you know generation that that I'm technically, you know, a Gen Xer. Uh, right at the mm -hmm. tail end. I was born in November of 1979. So I guess I'm a zenial, <laughs> they say. But, you know, hey, man, before we're all dead, we should have like some say over something. Right. So, um, yeah, that's it. That's me. And, and, you know, that's why I'm running. Wow. So a baby in November and, and running for Congress for the next November. So your baby will be turning a year old uh, during the election. Yeah. I mean, although this election is really about the primary. So I'm primarying yeah. Steny Hoyer. Mm -hmm. I am a Democrat. I am primarying Steny Hoyer from the left. And mm -hmm. um, the district is pretty darn blue, um, which is complicated um, because the, the district isn't really blue. The district is, you know, it has it, it where I am. It's very heavily blue. The largest population centers are very blue. But then we have more rural areas that, you know, mm -hmm. tend to be more independent and more Republican. But the. Yeah. By and large, the election will be won in the primary. So I have until May. Um, and I signed up right. to do this back in August. Um, I had my baby with a surrogate. So I didn't have the additional like having to physiologically heal um, from having my baby. But I did pick her up in Ukraine, um, which, you know, has the obvious challenges thereof. Um, wow. And I was convinced that I would have my maternity leave to do all the campaigning in the world because um, I just didn't really understand the reality of what things would be like. <laughs> so um, just coming back from maternity leave in my day job and also, you know, coming off of maternity leave for the campaign and, and hitting the ground running. Well, that that is that is a lot. That is a lot of things going on in your life. You, you've been to Ukraine in the middle of a, a war to pick up a baby. Now to run for to run for Congress against one of the most senior dinosaurs in Congress uh, that y you just decided to do it all this year. It sounds like <laughs> and I just finished building my house, too. So it's like, you know, uh, the the lovely barn dominium that you see behind you just uh, just got hey. finished back in September. Just knocking off some of the most stressful things you could possibly <laughs> do in your life all in like the span of a year or two. Right. Like just just getting her out of the way. Baby Might house, just be really, be really office, stressed you know, out check, 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 over check, check. a compressed, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I dig it. So, so I guess, um, why you, why now? Uh, that made you decide to do this. Obviously, you've got a lot going on. It seems like picking up a political campaign, um, in the middle of building a house and and having a baby and having to go to Ukraine to get the baby and all of that kind of stuff. Like that's that's a lot. Like that's. One of those things is all I'd want to do for an entire year, you know, and, and you're doing that plus now running against uh, in, in, in the Democratic primary, which I, I commend you. So many people um, uh, try to run third party for this kind of stuff. And we'll probably talk about some third party stuff a little bit later in here. And and as much as I want to support third party candidates right now, there's just no avenue for a third party candidate in our in our system, you know, with some exceptions, Bernie Sanders being kind of the. <laughs> the, the the 
the exception there. Um, but what made you decide uh, to do this to do this now um, and and to you know volunteer versus volunteer to be the the candidate versus supporting somebody else in that sense? Yeah, so we've had a few, you know, challengers to Steny over time, um, and they've just had a lot of trouble getting a toehold. Um, you know, I've had a position of power here, and I've been an active organizer here, and I felt like I have a lift of a name. I also have this convenient little side thing that I live in a town called Kroom, and my last name is Krooms, which I think <laughs> just, I mean, to me, it just like helps with the name, name recognition. recognition just but, built right in, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and then people think I'm old money, which I, I think I'm okay with. Um, maybe I'm not, you know, I don't know, but, um, uh, yeah, at least I know I'm not, so I'm good with it. But I, I think the, the thing is, look, we, we came out of, of COVID and, you know, we're not even fully out of COVID. There are people dying of COVID, right? But we came out with the opportunity to rethink who we are as people and how we want to live, right? We came out of, you know, the, the Trump years with the realization that Trump got elected for a reason, right? Like as mm -hmm. much as, you know, I hate that, uh, it's a, there's a reason, right? There's a lot of people who are struggling and there's a lot of people who are frustrated with the system and there's a lot of people who feel first disenfranchised, right? And that goes yep. on the Democratic side too, right? I mean, we have mm -hmm. a lot of folks that, you know, it's supposed to be enough that I live in a Black-led community and it's not and yet we don't have the things we need to make up what we didn't get before, right? Like I live in Prince George's County. It's a majority minority county. It is a black led community. Every person who I work for is a, is a black person and almost always a black woman, which is really freaking cool. You mm -hmm. know, my county executive is a black awesome, woman. Yeah. I sit on a cabinet, um, you know, with largely black women. My direct, you know, boss, the, the CAO is a black woman. And that's amazing and incredible. And they're being you know, multi-generational wealth here, largely because of federal jobs is amazing and incredible, but identity isn't enough, right? Like the people who are here's kids need jobs, right? The people who are here mm -hmm. need to have, you know, real investment in our infrastructure that was just systemically disinvested in, right? We need real change that is more than just iterative. And I'm not going to say that in a lot of ways, the Democrats aren't killing it, right? Like we got the IIJA passed, we got the IRA passed, you know, um, there's things happening around climate, which matters a lot to me, right? So we're seeing progress. And, you know, we didn't have a, a red wave in 2022, we kind of had a blue wave in 2023, right? Mm. So there are no. things that are happening. But my position is that when I look at the lives of, you know, largely millennials and, uh, you know, and, and uh, Gen Z's, right? And I look at what the future mm -hmm. that they're looking at, it's just, it's not freaking doable, right? And it's we can't wait bleak, any longer. Yeah. yeah, we can't wait to fix what's going on with climate and environment. We need to fix both at the same time. You can't just fix climate, you have to fix environment too, right? And those things have to work concurrently. We can't wait any longer to figure out what our work lives look like and what our retirement looks like. We can't wait any longer to make healthcare and childcare affordable. We can't wait any longer because, you know, I'm paying for childcare and taking care of my parents. And there are so many people in that situation. Um, you know, we can't wait any longer because last night I was at a hearing about affordable housing, about folks who are living in a really great mobile home community that they're a part of their community. They are, you know, interacting with each other, sending their kids to school. They're working. They're people who are, doing the jobs that need to be done in that county and they're, you know, they're about to lose their homes and there's nowhere for them to go that they could possibly afford in this community. Right. So these things are huge. They're huge. And we put them off, right. You know, immigration, um, renewable energy, like mm -hmm. permitting reform, uh, you know, like the future of transportation, what's going on with our highways versus transit. These are huge things and we need, smart people with experience to just get in there, roll up their sleeves and get the work done. Um, and they need to be from a diversity of backgrounds, right? We can't just have a bunch of lawyers. I mean, I'm a lawyer, but you know, uh, you know, I th I'm also a lot of other things, right? You know, I'm also right. a, a scientist and an engineer mm -hmm. and an agriculturalist, you know? And so I think that it's time for Congress to look like America, right? Which is 38 years old. America is 38 years old. Mm -hmm. And it is, you know, it, it's, it's well, the iron is hot and well, we are still figuring out what the world looks like post COVID. Let's make it the world we want it to be. Like, you know, my, my campaign slogan Absolutely. is a better world as possible because I believe it. I think we can just build, get in there and build it together. We built the first iteration of America. We built the first iteration that came out and, and led the world We've got a, we've had a pause, right? And it's time to do that. So it's now right. or never.
All right. Um. So I, you, I love you, it. Yeah. yeah. She, it's really great. You've talked about some of the the, I think bigger kind of umbrella issues here that you're passionate about and why you're getting involved uh, in the way you are. Um. Can we get a little bit down into the weeds on on like some specific some specifics uh you had a few here that you kind of wanted to talk about yeah uh, i was looking into you know your platform and specifically i found um a lot of info related to the the forward uh party um and their affiliation with you and what that kind of their platform was and um kind of their big couple of big things that they have is uh, ranked choice voting and voting reform and then also campaign finance and then lobbying reform um, it, is any of that something that you have like a plan for that you're looking for? Yeah, are, are you platform combating? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, I mean, one big thing here in Maryland is that depending upon where you live, your decisions are made in the primary, right? And yeah. in the district, it's, you know, we have a good percentage of folks who are independents. And we also have, you know, if we, we have slightly more Democrats, we have a large group of independents and we have Republicans. If you are a Republican in Prince George's County, you have never voted for anything ever. Like, I mean, you just are never (laughs) going to get a representative here. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I may not agree with you, but that doesn't mean that you don't get to have a say in what's going on. Right. And Mm -hmm. there's risks. There are big risks to people on the progressive side of the aisle by opening things up. But that doesn't mean that it's not the right thing to do. Right. Like sometimes you have to stand on the moral high ground of democracy and say that no one should be disenfranchised. So one of the big things that Forward Party in Maryland is working on is a single primary where you as a, you can be an independent and still have a, a you know a voice in the primary. You can be mm-hmm. a Republican and choose what primary you want to vote in. And I think that that's really important in terms of just if you are a lone Democrat living in a Republican area, like if you look down in St. Mary's County where they don't have by district voting, so they vote for their whole county leadership right now as a whole. Um, and there's slightly fewer Democrats than there are Republicans. So you know those folks. In a primary, if they were able to vote in the Republican primary, could at least, you know, have a voice on issues that they really care about, on driving who is the representative who's going to get represented, right? So I I think that's really important. Lobbying is corruption, okay? Every other country in (laughs) the world... When we go, so my husband is a democracy expert, and and you know, so I've gotten to go to a lot of these conferences around... Time out, time out, time out, time out, time out. What is a democracy expert? (laughs) So my husband works on helping countries that want to uh, do a better job with how their democracy runs do it. He, you know, he works on projects that are funded by the U.S. government. He works through, uh, you know, a, a nonprofit and he does a lot of work to help, you know, build the systems, um, whether that's in countries that are currently fledgling democracies, countries that are we are hopeful as America can become democracies um, or countries where there is sort of a government getting ready for when that country is no longer under, you know, some kind of a um, dictatorship. So there's conferences all over the world, you know, about this kind of work. Um, I also worked at the International Law Institute, which does, um, you know, a lot of anti-corruption work. Um, And the first thing you have to get over the first barrier you have to get over when you're working with folks from other countries is they want to understand what the heck lobbying is and why it's not corruption because it's so clearly corruption to everyone else in the world um and and so we have to deal with that right i'm really i'm pro term limits right but it's hard to have term limits without also dealing with the lobbying issue because what you don't want to have is lobbyists or you know even staffers but largely lobbyists who have too much power because the folks who are in office are just learning how to you know how to how to do their job and you've got these powerful folks writing the laws you know throwing money and and ideas around and you know just influencing the system in ways that are are not in the best interest of the regular person because you know, my neighbor is not as easily going to go in and talk to the, I mean, with me there, but with any other congressperson (laughs) and say, hey, this is an issue that I'm having, right? Um, As is, you know, oil company, utility company, uh, you know, whatever big business, whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. in some cases, other governmental interests coming in, right? So, um, or even things that I believe in, like big greens, right? Like, you know, I want regular people Mm -hmm. to have a say and they can't if we are, you know, if if we continue to treat lobbying like it's no big deal. 
so that's a that's a huge one for me and it and there's a lot of different political pathways that that could happen um and i'm in support of whatever gets us a little bit closer to there okay i i 100 uh, yeah. percent agree with all of that i'm still just stuck on this democracy expert thing <laughs> like, oh, uh we gotta help countries do democracy i know i know it's and it just complicated. it sounds I, i'm sure it's absolutely nothing like this but it sounds so much like you know we're gonna bomb we're gonna bomb you into freedom type <laughs> type of the uh, yeah, the people that's, who that's go over there as a non-DOD and... employee is to bomb <laughs> well i mean that is well, that is one of the problems that he fights with though right that we're dealing that people mm-hmm. that are in that industry are dealing with because that's who we were mm-hmm. as a country for a really long time and it's you know it's hard to come were? back from that yeah. well okay uh but <laughs> we don't have to be and i think that there's a lot of people in government who don't want to be that right like yes mm-hmm. there are you know they, they have they have begun to put up really good walls between the folks who are working on diplomacy type things and the folks who are you know the spooks behind the scenes right the the cia yeah right exactly exactly (laughs) so i mean (laughs) it's it's a huge thing right like why should anyone trust america right like Mm -hmm. we've done so we we have done so much good and yet we've done so much harm right like it's this Mm -hmm. it's this duality that's really complicated and we have a lot to earn with our neighbors, right? Like a lot of, yeah. you know, we, we started to enter into things and actually do what we said we were going to do. And then we had a, a presidential administration come in and be like, nah. Right. And so mm-hmm. we have to, we have to rebuild that trust and we have to figure out how we build structures that are stronger than politics that get down to the root of, you know, who we are as a country and who we are as people, because, you know, it's one thing to be the biggest, strongest bully in the room. And do I think that we need to have a strong military so that we can protect, you know, what we've built? Yes. But mm-hmm. it is another thing to be the most respected person in the room. And that is who I want America to be. I want America to be this experienced democracy that has seen it all, mm-hmm. um, recognizes that it's not always right, but has a lot of wisdom to share and a willingness to be generous with that wisdom and with the fruits of the things that we've earned that we've earned rightly and the things that we've earned, you know, through colonialism and through, you know, and in the wrong ways. Right. And I think we can be that person, um, you know, that country. And, and I think that's what most Americans want us to be. Like you want to be able to go to another country. And when they, when you're sitting around a table with a bunch of folks who are also traveling, when they ask you where you're from, be like America, not like America, you know, like Canada. We're definitely from Canada. <laughs> yeah. Right. I've, I've never done that. You know, I've never gone to another country and told people that I was Canadian, but I understand why people do. Right. Like, and I don't mm-hmm. want it to be that. I want, I mean, yeah, don't get me wrong. I think that that's overplayed and people are really fascinated with America and they want to understand, right. you know, many things about our culture, many things about our mm-hmm. governance system. Um, right. And Normal we are still a place to, to be proud of. The normal lives right. of Americans actually uh-huh. are. You know, yeah. right. They're not concerned right. about the, you know, the coup d'etats that we've uh, right. orchestrated mm-hmm. on a regular mm-hmm. basis when you're <laughs> traveling in their country. They're probably not going <laughs> to hold you personally responsible for like right. the Contras. <laughs> no, and I mean, yeah, especially there. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of those people don't have the the educational access to even probably put a lot of those things together. Possibly. Um, but I know, like in in Europe, especially. I mean, people were yeah, embarrassed yeah, when we had yeah. George Bush as president, and, and <laughs> those were the days. Um, but no, I I I hundred percent agree. Uh, agree with all of that. I think that we have have positioned ourselves as a uh, as the world police, as it were, whether that's good or bad. But that's the way that the uh, the world foundation is structured now, and we need to try to find the best. The best way forward and the most uh, diplomatic and, and democratic way forward with that. Yeah, I think I, I was, you know, I'm a on, mm-hmm. chronically online person, mm-hmm. and I believe there was a video that I saw or just saw a headline was that uh, democracies around the world are, like, shrinking. Like, there will be single-digit democracies in the next 20 years at the current rate of the decline of, like, democracies. No shit. I I mean probably not including Europe. I don't know like where they got that statistic, but like there's like a number of people that are living under a democracy will be decreasing over time. That it is has insane. been decreasing over time. That's absolutely insane. I mean, yeah. Wow. I that that's really catching me out of left field here because you know we've been spreading democracy for years. <laughs> well, we've been spreading our uh, our own form of democracy, which often is uh, actually an autocracy, uh, American funded, but. 
Um, uh, besides that, sorry, we, we get we get off <laughs> uh, off off a little bit here. Um, now the environment. I think that this is one that uh, you've you've put a fair amount of personal activism work and whatnot into. Um, and I think this is this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I think uh, climate change is one of the things that I'm personally most passionate about. Uh, and despite the platform that I have uh, trying to get people to ever, and I try to get people to pay attention to it and like, like get, I try to put my, my spin and my charisma or lack thereof or why ever people listen to me, I try to put that onto it, um, and just put into terms, uh, how dumb you have to be to pretend it doesn't exist at this point. And people, it just it doesn't engage it doesn't connect with people and i don't know if it's because we've been beat to death with it i mean i grew up you know under al gore and and uh inconvenient truth era and the world's ending tomorrow and and um i think a lot of people have just gotten numb to it maybe is what it is but it's we're recording today it's uh january 31st this will get posted at a later date but it's january 31st in minnesota so tomorrow is february and it is 50 degrees outside i am in a t-shirt this is what i wore in to the studio today to record this i'm in a t-shirt uh for a video earlier today i put on swim trunks and went shirtless and sat outside and i'm like i i did it for effect but it, it I sat out there for a while after I quit recording because I was like, this is actually pretty nice. Um, uh, that one's going to get flagged. Oh, yeah. for sure. For <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, but it's 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 like it's clearly a problem. And living up here in Minnesota where, you know, I remember being up here in the summer and it was 70s and 80s and it was comfortable to be outside. And now it's I it's hard for me to tell. I film most of my stuff outside. It's hard for me to tell if it's harder to film outside in the summer because I get too hot and I can't, I genuinely can't exist outside when it's 95 degrees and humid out here anymore or in the winter. And, uh, I, 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 I sorry, I'm getting carried away. Yeah, besides it? talking about the local yeah, uh, right, weather, right. that's uh, weather, not climate, Jordan. <laughs> it, it, it I know we, we have to tell people about it is, this, it but is, um, is. this is a sp- obviously <laughs> not that withstanding. Uh, the world has experienced the warmest year after year for the mm-hmm. past, like, nine out of the last 10 years mm-hmm. um and obviously is only going to get worse here it doesn't seem like we're making the strides that are necessary to keep us remotely to an increase of 1.5 degrees celsius here <laughs> um so yeah. so i guess um, this this is a big issue for you yes what what is your what would you what would you platform as um what are you running on as far as climate change as far as environmental policy goes what what is your path forward if you if you were, you know, ruler of the United States? Yeah. So, I mean, I support a human centric approach to dealing with the climate. Right. I mean, we know that from, you know, decades and decades of environmentalism that people are not interested in, you know, bathing in the, the rubber made tub. They're not interested mm-hmm. in, you know, making their own clothes from hemp. They're not interested in, you know, like uh, trees over whatever, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's mm-hmm. not the way to talk about environment. And you guys did a mm-hmm. really good episode, actually, I thought on renewable uh, energy and, and, you know, the other things that are great about renewable energy. Although I will Thank explain you. later why it's actually not going to be cheaper to put gas in your car um, because gas is the least valuable use of fossil fuels <laughs> and people want to make other stuff with it. But, um, we're ha- we're but yeah, like, wrong, so, you know, <laughs> And I'm also, you know, I'm an outdoorsy person. I like the environment. I, you know, I, mm-hmm. you know, people don't love this about me as a Democrat, but I have a gun and I hunt things and I eat them. Um, you know, oh, like, yeah. uh, it's, it's, <laughs> you know, seen any, as, it, it, we, we did do a gun episode. No. Uh, I've also done some, some gun content on TikTok, and it's mixed reception believe me but i'm i'm on i'm on your page there <laughs> yeah yeah i mean and and mm-hmm. i think that you know certain things in the gun world people should be allowed to have and should ha- be able to have at home and no one should know what they mm-hmm. have because you know people have the right to protect themselves from the state but um i digress mm-hmm. uh you know I, I, the reality is that you have to protect the environment at the same time that you are dealing with having to convert over to renewable energy And you have to protect Mm -hmm. people at the same time that you're dealing with both of those. So there's all of the health impacts that we know of burning fossil fuels, right? You you know, we we talk about the asthma rates. We talk about the pollution of our water. We talk about the pollution of our soil. 
you've got the fact that, you know, farmers are like some of my number one folks who I talk to about climate change because you have mm-hmm. you're trying to figure out when to plant your crops or like the mm-hmm. risk of things happening at the wrong time. You know, things going moldy because, drought, you know, hail. We, yeah, right. <laughs> Last year, we had a drought at the beginning of the, of the spring here in Maryland. And then mm-hmm. we had this tremendous amount of rain at the exact wrong time, mm-hmm. you know, that caused a lot of, you know, mold and, and mildew and fungal mm-hmm. growth. Right. So it was just a nightmare. Mm-hmm. Like I could not figure out the right time to put in my tomatoes and you know, re- resulted in my yield being uh, not mm-hmm. stellar. Um, so, I mean, you've got folks there. You, I'm in the Chesapeake Bay. So not only do people care about the Bay because it's freaking beautiful. And, you know, many of us feel like mm-hmm. it raised us as much as our parents did. You know, I was clamming right. in the Bay with my toes as a child. Mm-hmm. You know, I loved the beach. I loved being down there. I love being on boats, but also it's people's livelihood, right? I mean, we have watermen mm-hmm. here. We have a regrowth in oysters um, and an oysterman that is one, one of the best foods that you can eat for the planet. And two, just, you know, a great tradition out of, you know, this area of the country. We love our crabs. If you were to take blue crabs away from Marylanders, I just, I, I don't think that they would survive, right? I mean, it's, it's simply yeah, that something like that is thing. a deep part of our culture. Like- that was like the first thing that I ate when I visited Baltimore. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, we got to go to a crab house. And, and, and you're telling me that oysters are the best thing to eat for the environment? That's They're huge. Thing. Like if you're going to eat, you know, a, a living, th- you know, an, an animal thing, right? Um, mm-hmm. Oysters are tremendous. They filter the water. They don't have, you know, a tremendous amount of outputs. They obviously don't fart. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of reasons why oysters, and they also help contribute to the fact that one of, you know, the things that scare me about climate change are not, um, obviously not weather, although I worry about extreme storms, but I worry in the big picture about the fact that not only is our ocean holding most of this heat, right? So our ocean is getting warmer, mm-hmm. but our ocean is becoming more acidic, um, which could result mm-hmm. in the mass die off of all of these things in the ocean and eventually just all but kill the ocean, right? Um, mm-hmm. So gr- contributing right. oysters not only contributes to, it contributes to the local pH, so reducing the acidification locally of water. And, you know, it it offsets some of the development challenges from an environmental perspective because our biggest problems in terms of uh, pollution of our water here are nitrogen, right, Um, which is from Mm -hmm. fertilizers, it's from animal waste, Mm -hmm. and um, sediments, which are from development, right, and from the fact that we used to use our streams as where we sent the water from to get it away from our, you know, impermeable surfaces, which Mm -hmm. are the places where the water doesn't sink in. So the long and the short of it is that I I support that we have got to do something dramatic about climate. We have to commit to renewable energy. We have to make the right choices around fossil fuels. And we have to find all the places where we can get the most bang for our buck on reducing the amount of of methane that we're putting into the atmosphere. For example, I run a landfill and we're working really hard to improve our landfill gas collection processes and use that landfill gas for productive processes, uh, for productive uses. So... Mm-hmm. We have to do everything we can here. We have to lead by example, but we also have to figure out how we make it possible for other countries that haven't had the opportunity to be at the top of the food chain to develop and to, you know, have economies that work and have things like, you know, the right uh, child mortality rates, right? To have things like proper health care, to have all the infrastructure that they need. You know, I live in Prince George's County, which is like a microcosm of of the U.S. in terms of what, you know, investment has looked like. We are in this place that had systemic disinvestment because of who we are, right? There's the entire global south that has systemic disinvestment because of who they are. We now have to balance the equity, the need to uplift people around the world because the world has never been sustainable. There is a there's a great um a uh, young woman who just pu- published a book called Not the End of the World. Uh, I think her name is Richie, Hannah Richie. She's a, she's a scientist. And, you know, I, I, I heard her talking at, at, not that long ago on some podcasts. And, uh, you know, she was talking about the fact that we've never been sustainable. We're not looking to go back to something. Like, we're not looking to go back to, like, the agrarian society, right? Because mm-hmm. that was when half your children died, right? Like, that was when, yeah. you know, folks mm-hmm. didn't live very long. We want to lift everybody up to a standard of living mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, that makes sense. We want to continue to conquer poverty, but we also need to get off fossil fuels, right? And so we mm-hmm. have a responsibility to make up for the mistakes that we made, whether that is if we're going to cut off digging up, you know, fossil fuels, digging up coal, 
It's not reasonable to expect somebody who has been doing that their entire lives, who is, you know, 55 years old to do a complete retraining program that's going to take them five years so that they can work five more years, right? There are cases in mm -hmm. which we need to be willing to say, look, this community needs to continue to have income at the rate that it's used to having. And we need to pay for that, whether or not there is, you know, whether or not they're going to be able to move into renewable energy, right? And then the, the, the folks that are just coming into work or folks that are in the middle of their career, those are the folks that we need to get trained to work on renewable energy. We need to get trained to work on mm -hmm. green tech. We need to get trained to work on all of the healthcare technologies, all the things that we know that we're going to need in the future. But we have to be honest about the fact that people are being affected when we get off fossil fuels. And we have to make that commitment as a country to make sure that people can still live, which is why I like the Green New Deal, right? Like we're talking about mm -hmm. a Green New Deal for public schools, making sure that public schools are mm -hmm. places where not only are you getting workforce training, it's a healthy place for your kid to be. It's, you know, not using mm -hmm. too many government resources. It's producing its own energy. It's a resilience hub for people to go to when there's extreme weather conditions or when there's a power outage. There's so many things that fit into these different pieces of the Green New Deal that focus on communities, not just on tree hugging. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's I, 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 I honestly just didn't need another reason to want to eat more seafood. But now that you you gave me another reason to eat oysters, I'm I, I'm ready to steam ahead here on a, on that fixing our climate problems uh, i don't know that that's a great option in I, I, that is the, the best option that i've heard <laughs> i i think that we need we need federal investment in oyster farming <laughs> that's that's almost the opposite i think of what we're trying to do uh no but but i agree i also i also just to your point of coal um in the united states coal's dead because of fracking it's not because of green new deals uh or because of green energy or anything like that uh Right, natural gas. Natural, yeah. Frac fracking brought us cheap, cheap natural gas, and now it's just it's cheaper to burn natural gas than it is. Not that that's a whole lot better. I mean, it no. is somewhat better, but it's not great. Uh, right. It's not solar or wind. It's or, not solar or wind. Right. Or right. I mean, it's it's um, the beta or the VCR to our mm -hmm. you know uh, mm -hmm. streaming. I guess not even CD anymore. But you know what I mean. It's it's mm -hmm. it's that interim technology mm -hmm. that unfortunately, because of our politics, has a risk of becoming the default technology. So we have to be really careful about. Mm -hmm. But I lived in Harlan County, Kentucky. I was a public defender in Harlan County. Um, and so, you know, I saw firsthand what happens when a really good industry that provides really good jobs, mm -hmm. but has very bad externalities, right? Black lung, um, mm -hmm. the opium academic, etc. What that does mm -hmm. to a community. And I think that we have to be responsive to the needs of those communities and we have to be respectful, right? I mean, it's, it's, there isn't I, something I else agree. to do. Right. I do agree to an extent, but I always, I always think it's weird that this particular industry gets the, the, we need to worry about the, the feelings of the industry and the people who work in it when it's like every other industry becomes obsolete because it becomes obsolete for whatever reason that is, um, I mean, sure, some people complain, but it's not like, oh, you're you're uh, undermining our economy, you're undermining our jobs. It's just like the world moves on, and you either can be a part of it or not be a part of it. And why we've just we've just babied this particular issue to the point that we have. I mean, Trump ran on I'm I'm gonna get all the coal mines back up and running or whatever the fuck he was talking about back then, which I'm like, no, you're not. Again, it's just, it's economically not feasible anymore, not because of renewable energy or green energy, just because the the fracking companies can do natural gas cheaper than you can do coal. Um, and I think that's a, that's a fair point to point to the, the free market folks that are mm -hmm. out there listening and that uh, always point to like, right. oh, this is just how the world this, mm -hmm. is, this is how the world works. This is why we love capitalism. Uh -huh. um, I will say that the, I sort of equate that to like the, the proliferation of AI and the, in the way that it takes away certain jobs and mm -hmm. um, in that we people still need jobs. So right. like. But I mean, like, we're not like, oh, we're going to keep phone operators around, even though <laughs> cell phones exist now type of thing. Like, I mean, it's, it's no, you but know, that was in a time where that I, that, I think you could argue it's a completely different situation. <laughs> you could. Um, uh, I, I just I, I have trouble being empathetic to the 
to the plight of the coal miner maybe more than I should uh, because their industry has been dying for decades and I, it's become it's become a political hot potato versus an actual like there are solutions you there are there are programs that have been attempted to put in place to move past that specific obstacle and for me I just don't get it you are obviously a more empathetic person than I am and I pride myself on my empathy but uh, I, I, at at a certain point I'm like. You know, I, I get if we're talking about China or something and great, their their entire um, infrastructure was built on coal. And they, I feel like, are putting in equal, if not more effort onto moving into a more renewable direction than even we are in a lot of ways. Uh, but when you're when you still have entire communities and entire infrastructure built around that and trying to shift off of it. But we shifted off of that for completely different reasons. Um, but I do agree. I do agree on everything else with uh with transportation, um, obviously, uh, and 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 oil jobs and and all the, um, we're a very fossil fuel reliant uh, community uh, in the United States uh, specifically, um, and trying to make sure that uh, people don't feel like they are being disenfranchised as we try to move into a more sustainable future, not only environmentally but economically. I mean, fossil fuels aren't that economically sustainable if we really look at the big picture um so i appreciate that sorry i just i get so annoyed with the we need to worry about the coal miners um thing not specifically from you just in in rhetoric because obviously that's always a big uh gop talking point and a big uh a big push from from certain areas of the country that don't want to move on from old technology that's that's dead whether they like it or not and whether green energy happens or not and climate change stops or not um, I will stop blabbering on here and let you take <laughs> us to the next point. Um, yeah. So obviously, um, you know, this race is, it seems like you got your work cut out for you a little bit with, um, you know, the sort of, uh, entrenchment that your, uh, opposing uh, candidate has. Um, is there anything obviously other than, you know, uh, we we believe in you. We, we we would back you. I think and mm-hmm. um, sort of you know, where your mind's at. Obviously, uh, being you're not 84 years old, which <laughs> right. is a great start. That's it's a great start. Um, is is there anything you think that kind of puts you in a position um, that like you're you're the candidate to potentially unseat um, Steny Hoyer? Yeah, I mean, I What's think your path forward. Yeah, I bring a lot of qualifications that are unique to someone who's coming into a position like this, right? When you have someone who has been in charge for 40 some years, they know what the heck they're doing. So, as much as I believe that Congress is the house of the people and that everyone should be in it, I think that in this transitional period, I'm the right candidate because I've written federal budgets. I've defended federal budgets, mm-hmm. you know, to Congress. I've written local laws. I've written state laws. You know, I've contributed to federal legislation. I, you know, how, know how appropriations works. I know how, you know, I know mm-hmm. how a bill becomes a law. You know, I understand how all of these workings happen. Um, and I'm kind of a wonk on it, right? Like, I do pay mm-hmm. a lot of attention to what's happening with bills, what killed bills, you know, why, why things aren't happening. Um, And I've had a lot of success, right? I understand how money comes into local jurisdictions from the federal government. I handed out a ton of money um, under the Obama administration. You know, I I worked on state and local issues under the Department of of Energy and really got to understand what were the challenges on a community by community basis, right? Like, how hard is it to get a grant? How hard is it to actually turn that into, you know, your community community? developing industry? How do you balance economic development with the need to be more environmental? How do you take issues that seem really local, like, you know, uh, development in sprawl or affordable housing and roll them up into a federal piece of legislation that can actually move the needle? I understand those things, right? And I've been very successful at working that system. I mean, since I've had my job, uh, you know, just for, for a little over two years, I guess almost almost three years here in the county, I've been able to bring in, you know, millions and millions of dollars, really adding up to about $100 million in grant programs from the federal government, wow. right? And then through pass awesome. through to the state governments. So I understand how it works. And I can hit the ground running. And so I think that this is a unique, you know, I'm a unique candidate in that I'm bringing that into the conversation. And I think that 
I also have, you know, I just have a lot of things that represent a wider swath of our community. You know, one of the things that I didn't realize until I was you know, looking to run was that there are only six women in Congress with children under six. Wow. I didn't know that. I, I mean, mean uh, what, 435 people? That's a lot. Right. I mean, I mean that's crazy. That's yeah. crazy. Because, you know, mm -hmm. it's just like you've got to have somebody who looks like you, who represents things about you. And there are challenges, right? Because I, I mentioned that two of the counties that I, you know, that I'm in are majority black counties, right? And so there is a question of whether I'm I'm always the right person in that space. But I don't think that anyone thinks that an 80 some year old white dude is the right person in that space. Even if they're a pretty no. darn good dude. Like, I don't hate Steny Hoyer. I respect right. the heck out of Steny Hoyer. Mm -hmm. But I don't respect right. that he's been a politician for more than 50 years and that he's held a space that should have been occupied by numerous people over the last 40 years yep. in Congress. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I think I can win this race. Um, it's going to take ground game, but I've done ground game for a lot of other candidates. I know how ground game works. You know, I have no problem with you know, I, my, my wearing down the shoulders of my shoes, which I was literally doing yesterday, you know, walking mm -hmm. around and knocking doors, you know, um, I Absolutely. expect some pretty substantial, you know, organizer endorsements to come through over the course of the next month that I think will make a big difference mm -hmm. to the people that I have out there to do a ground game. And the biggest thing for me, you asked me before, you know, why now let's say mm -hmm. Steny Hoyer retires next time. We will have a mm -hmm. big open race of folks running. 10, 12, mm -hmm. who knows how many people. And so differentiating right. people amongst that pack of folks and ensuring that we Just get harder. a candidate yeah. who's progressive and forward thinking is going to be really challenging. Like to me, mm -hmm. I know it sounds crazy, but I feel like I have a better chance in this race than I would have in an open race because it is, right. do we want to do, do what we keep have been doing, right? Or do we want to try no. something new? That is the question, right? And that's the question I ask at people's doors. And I find that most people are like, look, I'm a little worried because I would really like those earmarks that, that Steny Hoyer brings in. Right. And he's been a friend to the mm -hmm. bases and, you know, those kind of things. But yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, let's 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 get this done. Right. You know, I talk to women and, you know, the, the, the Democrats are like, like, let's send us back so that we can codify Roe v. Wade. Why did you not do that 40 years ago? So we wouldn't be here. Right? right. I mean, there's a lot of people that yeah. are wondering why we let ourselves get here on a lot of issues and just want people to be more forward thinking, want to be thinking about what's coming yeah. down in 10 years, in 20 years, in 2100, when my daughter will be retired and the world is on fire. And now she's in her most vulnerable age. And, you know, there's there's resource wars potentially going on. Right. Like it's it's. Mm -hmm. It's just time. I think folks are are ready for change. Okay. Uh, what do you what do you think is your your biggest obstacle then? I mean, obviously you, you're confident that you got a path to victory here, but what you, you're this is the first time you ran for political office. It is. I, I ran for for delegate when I was in D.C. So I was a Bernie delegate, but then Bernie mm. didn't get enough votes for me to get to go to the right. to the uh, okay. Bernie, convention. Bernie. Uh, yeah. So it's the first well, race that we, yes, we, I run as a candidate. Okay, so so you you're a first timer. I think that there is a lot of people. Um, I hope that there is a lot of people who consume our content that uh, are looking to get into doing this. But it's it's a daunting task to think about running for for any office. I mean, it'd be a daunting task to think about running for city council. Now you're you know you're talking uh, a federal position. What? What are some of the obstacles that you've experienced and what are your biggest obstacles you think to uh, that path to victory for you against, again, obviously a very entrenched member of Congress? Um, so number one is there's too much money in this whole kit and caboodle, right? Like the number of people who told me I need to raise a million dollars to pull this off. And I'm like, I don't know who you think I know. Because I don't know a bunch of people that are going <laughs> to give me, you know, everyone's like, oh, call all the people who will max you out and give you 3,300 bucks. I'm like, I'm not sure that in my parents have passed and my mom would give me 3,300 bucks, but like, you know, it's, it's right. like the ridiculousness of it. And I find it offensive, right? I find the money that, that is required to do this offensive because I do think that, you know, I want teachers and nurses and, you know, farmers and retired people and young people all in Congress. And it's going to cost this much money. And then there's just so much of an industry around it, right? It's not like that mm -hmm. money is just going to like 
pay somebody 20 bucks to knock some doors or something. It's like, there's so much around it, right? That's Mm -hmm. a huge obstacle. It's a huge pain in the butt, right? Do I do it? Do I call, do my call time? Yeah. Yeah, I do. And I'm trying, I mean, I'm trying to do actual grassroots, like not that, like you get 700 text messages from all the people who are trying to do grassroots allegedly who you've never heard of, but like, you know, that $20 Mm -hmm. at a time, but it's also, I mean, it's expensive to, you know, I need a campaign manager because I have a baby and a life and, you know, I need someone Mm -hmm. to help me and tell me what to do. And that's expensive. Right. And I need Mm -hmm. materials and that's expensive and I need time and time is money. Right. And so that's, that's hard. Yeah. My name is known in Prince George's County, but only part of Prince George's County is in the district. So getting my name out there means knocking doors, handing out pieces of paper, Mm -hmm. going to homeowners association meetings, you know, and that's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And this is a compressed timeline because, you know, I I let life get in the middle of, you know, my campaign, Mm -hmm. God forbid. Um, You know, so that's that's a huge one. Mm -hmm. And then there's just the democratic machine, right? Like there's to the people who they want to be the candidate versus, you know, the regular people out there running. And, um, you know, there's just like a lot of obstacles involved with that. And even though I'm a super proud Democrat, right? Like it's where I want to be. It's my, you know, it's, it's, Mm -hmm. it's the political home that I'm in. It's really frustrating and disappointing, right? That it is hard to get a toehold if you are not the expected candidate or not the person who's been groomed to do it. Mm -hmm. So all those things are hard, right? Right. They're hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can be you can be a proud, a proud member of the party and still be like, hey, our party's got a lot of fucking issues that need to be resolved that we've been saying need to be resolved. And clearly the party hasn't been listening to us. And obviously you were a Bernie delegate and uh, feel that way. uh, (laughs) Yeah, what happened to Bernie? Mm -hmm. Like we we were screaming as loudly as we could. Uh, We want some some specific changes. And they're like, no, no, you don't. You you want. You want Hillary. That's what you want. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I think obviously you're dealing with something that's um, as entrenched in, in the political system as as Hillary Clinton or as Joe Biden or as any of the names that we are uh, familiar Certainly with. Certainly in the House. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely in the House. I mean, 40, think about that. 40 years. He's He's been doing politics longer than either of us have been alive. Yep. and. Yep. Nearly I mean, as, yeah, as nearly as long as, as, well. as you've been alive, and that's, uh, I, I, it's it's ridiculous. Uh, term limits. How do you feel about term limits? So I feel very strongly about term limits. I don't know exactly what the right number is, right? Like, I haven't been on the inside, and um, I think mm-hmm. that I would have a better perspective of that from the inside of exactly, like, is 12 and 12 the right answer? Is something shorter than that? Is something longer than that the right answer? But term limits will work much better. I think we should do term limits regardless, but... Term limits mm-hmm. will work much better if we get rid of lobbying, right? Because I, oh, if yeah. you don't well, get rid of the lobbying, then you've lobbying. got all of those additional <laughs> risks, right? And you just have to work that much right. harder to make sure that the folks that are coming in are ready um, and, and you know, aren't getting influenced, whether they want to be or not, by the, the mm-hmm. what I said again, is, is open corruption in our system. Mm-hmm. Which I I still just I still yeah. just get a kick out of the uh, I, I I I prom I I swear I'm not picking on your husband at all the um <laughs> the, the the democracy expert I'm picking on America going and like teaching other countries democracy and like when you were just pointing out the whole thing like yeah but you're just letting you're letting corporations shell out the money and be like hey this is what this is what your politician should do and that doesn't sound like the democracy thing I read about in school. Uh, do as just, I say, not as I do, mind. like your parents say, uh-huh. I guess, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, that's, it's, it's, uh, it's so frustrating. It's, you know what? Honestly, that just sounds like the most American thing. It really, it really think, honestly honest. does. I mean, that is, that is about as American as you can get. <laughs> if, if, if we are being honest, not in a good way, but in, in, in the in most the Ameri- classic American, in way. the classic American way. Um, no, I, I agree. A, a thousand percent. Yeah, um, we've done episodes on campaign mm-hmm. uh, finance reform, mm-hmm. and uh, lobbying is the first thing mm-hmm. that we would get rid of. If so, we could get rid of. Anything. And I'm assuming you consider Citizens United lobbying. Then you you oh, put yeah. that under that umbrella. Yeah, I mean, um, campaign uh, yeah. finance. I mean, in a perfect world where I had a super functional legislature, my position mm-hmm. is that the Constitution should specifically say that the interests of the people come mm-hmm. before the interests of the shareholders. And that would solve that entire problem, right? Because 
Citizens mm-hmm. United is part of that problem, but also that fiduciary duty that prevents companies from being truly green, right? From really doing, mm-hmm. um, you know, environmental responsibility, from really doing, right. you know, mm-hmm. equity, like not DEI, like we're going to put some letters in front of it, like real equity mm-hmm. where people are really being heard, where you're getting paid as much as a woman, particularly as a black woman, as a white man, you know, where... Mm-hmm. The experts are being, you know, we're developing the experts, right? We're making sure that there's the same access to education the whole way along. And then we're making sure that they're sitting in the boardroom. You know, I think I'm not sure where the the 20 by 20 folks have gone, but like there's these women who are working on 20% of boardrooms um, being female by 2020. And I I don't think they got there, right? Like, I mean, yeah, right. So those things are all prevented because... In the end, even if a CEO was the, was, you know, I don't know, Mother Teresa, I guess she's not even that good, but, you know, a a really good person, (laughs) um, they would not be able to make choices on behalf of the company nor the board members that Mm. were in the best interest of Americans. They have to make them in the best interest of shareholders. Right. You can make an argument to like your shareholders to say, like, if we invest in these things, that will show that we are for these growth properties or the, mm-hmm. we're, we're making good co- on our commitments and that'll hopefully help consumers drive themselves to our products. But that's, that's an argument. That's not a, right. like and, something and that can be, you know, argued against. A lot of that could be resolved simply with, uh, taxing shareholder returns and putting the, um, right. put, br- bringing corporate tax rates back up and putting, uh, your, your return on investment in equity of company, not in shareholder returns that, at quarterly shareholder returns, you know, like we did for uh, many, many years before Reagan ruined the world. Um, but uh, I think I think we're getting close to, to wrapping it up here. Um, I wanted to talk to you just kind of a little bit about big picture politics. Obviously, you you were involved with the Bernie campaign. Big picture politics is something you've um, you focused on a little bit. Uh and, and I, I personally feel like we're kind of at a tipping point in the Democratic Party. Obviously, they've been shoving um, neoliberal uh, party politicians down our throat for many, many years, and people are getting fed up with it. Um, and obviously, I think that's kind of the reason that, that you're running is like, yeah, hey, Steiny's great. There's nothing wrong with him per se, except for the fact that he's been doing this for 40 years, and it's time to have some new blood. Uh, but this isn't a problem specifically with with your specific district. This is a, a nationwide problem. And um, is there uh, is there anyone running um, in other districts, in other uh, Senate, um, a- any any place that you think on kind of a national scale, people talking about this, that you want to draw attention to them? Anybody you would quote unquote endorse, I suppose, if you had uh, that ability um, that even we would like to look into and hopefully other people can look into that may be running in their areas. I mean, you know, I think that there's a lot of folks who, you know, came onto the scene last time and I don't feel like slipped by. And yet now the big money's coming out against them, right? Summer Lee is a great example. Mm-hmm. Corey Bush is a great example. You know, there, there are women who are, you know, killing it. And um, now mm-hmm. you've got like hard co- core opposition money coming, you know, out, out for them. I think, I really want people to pay it, ev- pay attention at every level, right? Like mm-hmm. one of the things, you know, I, I don't have a better choice than Biden. Right. And in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. Biden's the best president of my lifetime. Right. I mean, he's done, if you look at it from, you know, from that perspective, which is super funny because I grew up in Delaware and was like on his 1988 campaign as like a little tiny child. Mm-hmm. So it's super weird for me. Um, like I've seen him in a toga at the prom dancing with his daughter. It's, it's strange. <laughs> right. But, um, mm-hmm. We don't have another choice but Biden. We have got to elect Biden this no. time around, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that the job of like organizers and folks working out in the community and even just, you know, regular folks is to find someone who will get people inspired to come out to the polls to make sure that we crush it, right? Because this is the mm-hmm. opportunity to crush MAGA and have it just be done, right? Because it's less and less popular mm-hmm. within the within the Republican Party itself, right? It is an idea that's that's never even had a time and just needs to be mm-hmm. over, over. And if we can bring people out en masse to say, look, this is this is the, you know, close the book on it. I think that's really important. So mm-hmm. I, I, 
look to you know races at 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 all kinds of levels um I'm trying to think i i just was reading about this amazing um woman who's a climate hawk out in um california who's running in a pretty tough race you know there's just interesting races across the country and mm -hmm. there's interesting things going on in local government too where it can make a huge difference i write laws all the time right like i'm in the you know i'm in the executive branch and I work with my county executive and we come up with something that's a good idea. And then we just get it done. If you, you can probably mm -hmm. write a law for your county. You can probably write a law for your city. You can probably come up with a program mm -hmm. and get it funded. Right. And so I want people to look at local government as something that's important. And then if there's someone there that you back, that's going to get you out to get onto the higher level races. Right. Absolutely. And I, want to I see mean, we've these, talked yeah. repeatedly mm -hmm. about, about, uh, the importance, How important. of local, <laughs> yeah, local the importance government. of local elections and local mm -hmm. government. Um, I don't think we've had anybody who has discussed some of the like the the realities of what you can do beyond just like voting and mm -hmm. um, like volunteering for a candidacy. Uh, like you're you're saying, like there's there's laws that you could promote as citizens and and programs that you can promote and possibly get those funded and. That's that's interesting. Um, you know, the most that we've talked about is like ballot measures, mm -hmm. um, which is probably more difficult than just like county level programs. Yeah. Yeah. Last uh, night I went so, to so a how county... can people write a law? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go, ahead. Say, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. Last okay. night I went we to a, a, bit of a lag here, to so. a county, um, uh, just a county meeting where um, the county, uh, the county leadership in that county was just asking for feedback. It's basically a public meeting. And this room was packed. I mean, it was packed. It was standing room only. And it was folks talking about, you know, the need to fully fund education, the need for affordable housing, about this particular community that was, you know, at risk of being lost. And there were five-year-olds talking about how they wanted to see, you know, more the full funding for indoor sports arenas. There were, you know, 10-year-olds talking about being concerns about their charter schools shutting down. And no matter what side of the aisle someone's issue seemed like, every single person who came up and said something got the applause of that entire room because it means awesome. something to go to your local government and say mm -hmm. something. It means something to stand up for yourself. And in this case, it particularly meant something if you were a Spanish speaking person because they didn't have a damn interpreter. Right. So there's a bunch of people Ooh. whose homes are like directly in the line of the bulldozer who are there and mm -hmm. they just stood up and spoke in Spanish. You know, because they they were there and they had that forum and they got the applause of people who may, may or may not have any idea what they were saying. Right. But it matters and it does make a difference. And and I, I have to think, you know, I, I hope that those commissioners saw what that means, like that there is organizing happening against them. Organizing matters. Getting you and five of your neighbors together to go down to whatever mm -hmm. your local leadership is and say, you know, the park is got giant mud holes in it and my can't, kids can't, can't play soccer is going to have mm -hmm. as much of an influence on your life in a lot of ways than, you know, who the president is, right? Like, I mean, we oh, all know that, yeah. that like so yeah. many of these policies are local. So I love working mm -hmm. in local government. I will miss working in local government. I love working at federal government too, because in the federal government, you get to influence a ton of things too. It's just like a workaday staff person because mm -hmm. you're so, it, it's, it's not the deep state. I don't want everybody to decide that I'm the deep state. <laughs> Are you but sure like, about that? I don't know. <laughs> right. But you do you get Illuminati. to use your expertise to make communities better, right? Like when they were deciding whether they were going to put solar panels on the, you know, on the courthouse or the firehouse, I got to talk about the angles of the sun and why it mattered more to do it here or there, you know? when they were deciding whether they were going to change out the street lights and what the, you know, number of Kelvins was all of those things, like little things I got to really influence and, and mm -hmm. how the program was deployed and what, you know, how to interpret things like by American in a way that really brought uh, industry, like things like that you get to do in government. So I love, I love government. I, I know that a lot of people don't. Um, I think we have a lot higher duty to people to tell people what we're doing with their money because you're an investor mm -hmm. You're an investor in the U.S. government. You're an investor in your local government. And the damn bell would better give you, you know, a report of what they're doing with your money. Um, but absolutely, yeah, there's just so much an opportunity to get involved. And I know people don't have time. Right? I get that people are working three jobs mm -hmm. and I get that they're driving way too far to get to work. And I get that child care is too much money and I get that health care is too much money. And I'm going to work on fixing those things. But where there is time, I would say that that time 
is often really well invested in trying to get something done locally. It's awesome. All right. Yeah, well, I, totally agree. I think we're, we're buttoned up against the end here. I wanted to know uh, Democratic Party as a whole, since we were still we, we somehow made it back to a local government again. But um, <laughs> this was this was back. big picture politics. Uh, what do you think? Because I have all kinds of uh, all kinds of opinions that nobody wants to hear again. But what do you think the top three policies uh, that the Democratic Party should be platforming in 2024 to get people to the polls to vote? Um, just I, I we, we don't need like in the weed stuff, just the top three, just uh, elevator pitch policies. What what should we be like? Hey, this is the top three things that the Democratic Party is pushing in 2024. Uh, if you believe in these things, if you support these things, go out and vote. What do you think will get people to the polls? I think it is uh, being a woman is not a criminal and we want our rights back and we want them expanded. Mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. it is we need real infrastructure investment in this country. And, you know, that doesn't just belong to the richest suburbs of the richest cities. It belongs to rural communities. It belongs to cities. It belongs to suburbs. It belongs everywhere, uh, including transit everywhere. Um, and I think mm -hmm. that it is that. And this is less of a platform and more of a you've got to show it. The equity actually matters mm -hmm. to us that we're not just going to like stand next to a person who doesn't look like us and tout them and, you know, tokenize them and, and, and you know, say <laughs> that we have equality. Right. We need genuine equity mm -hmm. where we're making real investments in people who have been, you know, and, and in the people who have been disinvested in and really working to break down these systems that we know are oppressive and we know are racist by using science and you know, like known things that work to, to solve community problems. Yeah. I like it. I, I like it a lot. I think, uh, I think especially, um, again, uh, and I'll leave this, um, you're, you're a, a rural person. I think pushing uh, infrastructure, which you just mentioned there, to, to rural America and things that can impact rural America uh, is something that the Democratic Party has really slacked on in uh, it's probably since the Clinton era, if not before. Um, and why uh, a big part of the reason why rural America has has skewed right in, I don't want to say recent years because it's been 40, 50 years now. Um but I, I think that that's that's really important. I know living out here in in the middle of nowhere, uh, it's it's hard to get that kind of recognition of you know what are they doing for us here. And even though I know the things because I spend a lot of way too much time on the internet, um, a lot of people don't get that feeling that they're being noticed. And and in a lot of ways, they aren't being noticed because you've got these big blue city centers, and it's way easier to spend campaign dollars focusing on winning, you know, a Los Angeles or a New York City than it is you know, Pine City, Minnesota or, or rural Maryland, um, Crooms County um, or anything like that. Just and Crooms. Uh, Crooms. Prince George County. Prince George. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so I, I, I resonate with that. Um, I agree with that 100%. Uh, you can leave us with your um, your campaign uh, pitch if you want here. Uh, let us know again. Remind everybody where you're running, why they should vote for you. Um, and, and thank you for, for coming on here with us. Sure. Uh, so my name is Andrea Crooms again. I'm running in Maryland's 5th Congressional District, which is Southern Maryland, which is everything west of the Chesapeake Bay, between the Chesapeake Bay and Washington, D.C. Um, and, you know, I I believe a better world is possible, and I want us to build it together. All right. It's amazing. Thank you so much for uh, coming on and being our, our first person running uh, for office on, on the podcast. We appreciate having you here. Yeah, and, it's been um, a real pleasure. It's been a real pleasure. It really it's has been. been. Uh, I, we're, we're from Minnesota, so unfortunately we can't vote <laughs> for you, but you definitely have our vote if, uh, if we were out there in Maryland. Um, I mean, I we, take again, small, small distributed you. donations, you know, $5 does make a difference. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, we, you bet. we, we can, we can, we can probably shoot something like that your way. I'm also, uh, I'm hoping that I'm hoping that we give you a little bit of, um, publicity to reach a couple more ears. You know, we're by no means some big famous operation here, but, uh, but a I couple found people you, so listen other people to us are once in a while. You, right? So absolutely. Absolutely. So. 
uh, we we really do appreciate you being on. We are rooting for you. Obviously, we are looking for for younger blood in Congress, people who represent uh, people like us and people who believe what we believe. And we definitely think that you are one of those people. So um, you have our endorsement officially for a district that we've got nothing to do with. <laughs> but we we definitely want you to be to be running it. Um, nothing against Steiny, but we are uh, looking forward to seeing you in Congress. Yeah, we're looking forward to seeing you back on the podcast uh, as a Congresswoman. So, yes, you know. Well, we 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 hope to have an official U.S. Congressman from from Maryland on the podcast here in a few months. So awesome! All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we will see all of you guys next week. Once again, we appreciate everybody listening. We appreciate the few people who tune in and watch. Um, check out offjawagon.com for merch. Uh, check out Andrea Crooms for Congress. What's your website? It's croomsforcongress.com or just andreacrooms.com. Just Google Andrea Crooms. You'll find me. All right. Find okay. her there. Check her out. Give her money. Uh, tell her you, uh, you love her and want her to be in Congress. And uh, we will see you guys next week. Absolutely. Thanks for tuning in.